Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about Braxis Holdout. Now, Braxis Holdout is a pretty interesting map, but it's one that can be really frustrating to a lot of people. To start out, what is Braxis Holdout? Braxis Holdout is a StarCraft-based map that you will sit on these two objective points here, as well as one here. And if you are holding both of these points, you will start charging up your Zerg pods, which are located here, 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 and over here. These will slowly grow with a variety of Zerg that pop up in here over the course of the amount of time you're channeling. Now, if the enemies were to take one of these points, then they would be stopping your channel. And if they were to take both of these points, then they will be channeling their own Zerg. This map also includes uh, four maps, or sorry, four camps. You have one large camp here one large camp here, one small camp here, and one small camp here. This makes this map a little bit uneven, and the reason I say that is because while the draft often has a one-on-one -on -one top and a four versus four bot, what you notice a lot of times is that the one-on-one -on -one top, the right side has a little bit of an advantage. And the reason why is because if you have someone who can do camps very quickly, then they can quickly get this small camp right here in between fights. However, because this camp over here is very large, you can't really do that because it would take you much longer to do that and you'll likely lose out on two waves of soak. Making it very difficult for the solo laner on the blue side and easier for the solo laner on the red side. Speaking of that, it's also the same thing on the red side. The red side has a large camp for the four lane and a small camp for the blue lane, which means that if the four man wipes the whole team, they can quickly get a very large camp to push with it on the blue side. So does that mean that the red side gets an advantage over the blue side? Well, yes and no. One of the reasons why I say no is that it's pretty easy where if the blue side gets a wipe on the red side, not only can they take this big camp and help out their solo laner, but they can have their solo laner push with this big camp and they can get the bottom one easily. Making it to where both sides have their advantage, but it's different. So you still have to play differently on both sides to get this advantage. Utilizing these camps at the right times for your side is extremely important. So I would recommend practicing the camp timings. How should you draft on this map? Well, to start out, it usually goes on a one versus one and a four versus four playing style. So, you want to have a strong 4-man that's great at doing AoE damage, that's also great at surviving AoE damage. The solo laner usually needs to be someone who can win in a solo lane versus another person for a long period of time. Someone who can get poked out of lane like a Greymane is not necessarily the best compared to someone who has self-healing like a Sonya or Ragnaros. Because the Greymane is simply going to get poked out of lane, he's going to have to get a fountain, he's going to come back, he's going to get poked out of lane, and then he's going to be gone, and the Sonya or Ragnaros will be able to hold the zone for a long time. A Ragnaros versus a Raynor is interesting to say the least, but if the Ragnaros plays it well, his Q will be out healing the damage that the Raynor is doing, but the Raynor is also ranged, so the Raynor could be poking the Ragnaros out of lane as well. Based on how this plays out, it could be pretty interesting. So how do you beat this lane for either team? Well, to start off, the Raynor can poke someone down, and then someone can roam like a Maiev and kill off the Ragnaros. Or... The Ragnaros could slowly whittle down the Raynor and then have someone like a Genji roam and they could take out the Raynor. Either one of these things can happen and can make it good. So when you're drafting, you not only want a strong one-on-one, -on -one, you want a strong four-on-four, -four, but also having someone like a Maiev or a Genji who can rotate makes it a lot easier if your solo laner is having trouble because all you have to do is rotate up to make sure that your solo lane can win. As you can see, the Genji rotates up to see if he can get a kill on Raynor, only to find out that he can't get a kill on Raynor, and he starts heading back down. Utilizing this four-man versus this one-on-one -on -one and also having people rotate is how you win the game on this map. Now, as we're getting into this, you can see that both teams drafted pretty well for this map. We have Morales and Deckard, who are very good at keeping people alive for long periods of time. We have two people top lane who do decent against each other as well as we have a decent chunk of wave clear between Lunara, between Ragnaros, between Diablo, as well as the enemy team has a lot of wave clear with Kael'thas, with Artanis, as well as uh, Maiev. 
So we have a lot of wave clear on both teams, a decent amount of roaming on both teams. You can see that the Maiev is now trying to roam so that she can help beat the Ragnaros in lane. And this is kind of a fun ebb and flow that goes back and forth where the both teams are constantly trying to find situations where they can gank the other team and they can help their team win in different lanes. And you can see we're just, I just trying to get uh, Maiev out of the lane. And I'm already going to back, so I'm just trying to use my health. When you get in kind of a stalemate like this and your solo laners can't help or you can't have someone who can roam and help the solo laners, that's when you want to utilize the camps. Situations like this is really where you want to utilize the camps as much as possible, where you're not really getting too much progress in these actual fights, so you need to find another way to get progress. So we're fighting, but we're getting very, very low. And Deckard's not great at AoE healing, so we need to back up and try to survive as long as possible. In this case, we're likely going to lose this one objective, but we got 62% on it. So even if we lose the objective, we still have this giant Zerg force that's been created already. So even if the enemies get something all the way up to 100%, we still have this Zerg force that will be sent either way. Which is nice for us, because it looks like right now we might lose the rest of the objective as three people are engaging up on top lane. As well as this Ragnaros, there's no chance that Ragnaros can fight three people. So, we all just need to get back to life and get back in there and likely we might lose one. If you are behind, oftentimes what a lot of players will do is they will soak for a little bit. But if they're just going to lose the full thing, you're going to lose out on a lot of experience. So what sometimes people will do is something that we, I mean, it's, it's easy to call it the ring around a rosy. Which essentially means you have five people who pick one lane. As you can see, a lot of times you're split between two versus two or one versus one and four versus four. But a lot of times what teams will do is they will go a five-man team if they're behind. And they will go and attack like the group of three that's here. They will kill the group of three and then they'll get a camp. They'll get a camp and then they'll go up and they'll kill the group of three up here. And then they'll get a camp. And then they'll get a camp, and then they'll head back down. And if you do this really well, and you're coordinated really well, this allows you to go from being behind in one of these objectives to ahead really, really fast. If the enemies are sticking with their one-on-one -on -one solo lane and their 4v4, you can have this five-man go and get a lot of value very quickly. It's kind of a higher rank strat, something that happens in team league and higher ranks, but it's something that you can practice in your team leagues. Probably won't be able to do it too much in QMs, but it is definitely a strategy that you're going to want to practice whenever you get a chance. We're sticking with the 2 on 2, but the benefit of keeping this 2 on 2 for as long as possible is their tank is sitting up here and our tank is down here. So we should have actually a better fight down here if possible, but maybe not. We also were able to kill their tank up there, so... Uh, we're able to hold this zone, but you can see on the other end, while we were able to capture one zone, we can look at theirs, and you can see their giant Zerg wave as well. So even if we were to get the rest of this objective, which is what it looks like is going to happen, they still have this giant Zerg wave. So they're backing right here, and it looks like it should be pretty easy for us to get the rest of this Zerg wave. And you can see right here, it's just filling up with all these zergs the longer we challenge or channel it and once it's all all the way channeled up to 100 percent then it releases both of the zerg waves one for top one for bottom and it alternates sides afterwards so for example right now it's blue side on this next time we're gonna have the blue side over here down on bottom how do you want to act when you have the objective well ultimately you want someone with high wave clear to be defending against the objective someone like a ragnaros who can simply just pop a trait Pushing with an objective, you want someone who has a lot of siege damage like Lunara. In this case, we're doing it a little bit reversed, but they were already in the lanes, so it's just something that we ended up choosing to do. But a lot of times, you do want your largest wave clear to defend against a wave, and you want your strongest damage to push with the wave. You normally want your full team to push with it, because it's nice to push with your wave, seeing that you can pick off kills, because there's a lot of things in here that do a lot of damage. All of these Hydralisks, if they kill a unit and they switch targets onto a hero, watch how fast these heroes go down in health, just because of all these minions. You can see Genji's pretty low, you can see the amount of health that's being done to Lunara. So if you're playing someone like a Varian, who can jump in and attack the enemies whenever they're going in, it can be very, very valuable for your team to pick off people who are trying to defend against the objective. 
Especially if they only have one or two people that are defending. It's nice to break the front wall and have everyone just dive in and stop it. Say for example you have a Gul'dan who defends and everyone else goes to attack. And this team goes to attack. They could charge in, taunt the Gul'dan and kill off the Gul'dan. And continue pushing on even further. This map is one of the challenging maps because it is considered one of the most snowballing maps in the game. What I mean by that is if you win one of the objectives and the enemy doesn't get any of it and you push with five on that objective, there's a good chance that you're going to win all the rest of the objectives just from the experience values that it gives you alone. Deckard's going the rainbow build. That's interesting. Not saying it's bad, just interesting. On... This, oh, this is going to get really tough. And this is kind of what you want to do. You want to outpoke the enemies, and you want to back up. If you're all low like this, every one of them should just back. It looks like they're going to get fountains. But um, normally, you just want to back up. There's nothing going on right now. You're going to want to go for objectives. You want to go for camps. You're going to want to go for other things. Not really just going for fights, especially when you're really low. This is a chaotic fight right there. Why did I go Dragon Blade on this comp? I should have gone uh, X Strike, right? I have no idea why I went Dragon Blade. Ooh, I didn't use my Deflect, I guess. Apparently, I'm just a bad Genji. So, Ragnaros is really strong on this because he has Lava Wave, which can clear the giant Zerg waves. He also has his trait, which can clear the giant Zerg waves, making him one of the best defenders in the game. And he's one that can really prevent the snowball. If you utilize your abilities too early, though, you might be you might not have him for the actual wave. So it's something that it was a risk that he decided to take, but not something that you always want to do. As this might also get him killed, depending on how he positions over here. He needs to dodge the gravity laps. Uh, didn't dodge it. He might still be okay. Oh, he is really in there. Oh, he's doing a lot of damage, though. Ooh, this is tough. Well, he's definitely dead, but maybe we can kill Kael'thas? Yeah, Kael'thas is dead, at least. So, it was a one-for-one. One. Very risky. Normally, you don't want to do that. If you're playing Ravenrose, you want to play pretty safe with it. You want to just win the solo lane and utilize your, your ults. But you can see, because of all that stalling that happened top lane, uh, Blue Team was able to pick up a camp, and they're pushing with the camp even though they don't have the objective. This is another thing you can do too, where if you find yourself constantly losing one side, but you're winning the other side, you can push with four on the side that you're winning and just get a lot of value even without the objective. They're going in here and they're destroying the fountain, and we've already destroyed the fountain top lane. So despite the fact that we're losing top, we're still getting so much value off of bottom, with only two people being down here. I mean, look how much damage they're doing, it's incredible. Like Ingrid right there and Jacob, they're doing so much damage. They're doing getting so much value. And looks like... And Diablo did something really good there. He didn't push Kael'thas towards uh, Lunara. So Lunara was able to survive. He would have pushed Kael'thas over there and didn't do his W in, or his e, e in time. Kael'thas might have been able to land one more auto attack and kill off Lunara. So we have a Lava Wave going out first. Again, normally you want to save that for later. But he did do half of Artanis' health, which was pretty nice. Uh, we have Genji who's just getting the objective up here and trying to defend it against Raynor. We don't know if Raynor's actually going to try to fight that or if he's just going to hang out. Red team was able to get it back, but you can see there's already a giant wave in here. So now blue team, even if they don't keep the objective, they could go through and just get camps or whatever. And they still have a really strong push for when they do have the... Uh, when the objective does pop. Or they can quickly try to force a 5v5 and go for a really strong rotation. Which is what we might see here. We don't have Deckard, but we are going for a really strong 5v5. We're splitting damage a little too much. Uh, I probably could have killed this Kael'thas a lot earlier. And it is going to be a pretty awkward fight for us. Yeah. That was really good on Deckard, though. But Deckard wasn't with us on that fight. If Deckard was with us, we probably would have won that fight, and we could have done the round or the uh, ring around the rosy where we go and we grab the camp, we grab the camp, we grab this, we grab the camp, we grab the camp, and then we grab this, and it would have worked really well because we did have a strong five v five team fight. And if you have that issue where your team seems to do better in five v fives, you have to do that ring around the rosy. It's the only way. 
Um, and again, Rag doesn't have his Lava Wave, and he doesn't have his trait. So this can be very difficult for him to defend, but he will have his Lava Wave in 20 seconds. So you normally want to do that. One Lava Wave alone is usually good enough to where it can clear all these little minions. So all that's left is some Hydralisks, some... Uh, I can't remember what these guys are called, and uh, Hive Masters? I don't remember. I haven't played StarCraft in, in that long, so... Uh, but yeah, the Lava Wave alone usually clears everything, but right now they're a little low to be staying here. Genji decided to push with this. It's just so that I can essentially play really aggressive and get them low so that they're too afraid to do anything, but I end up rotating up here when I see that Artanis is playing really aggressive. When you get a kill after an objective like this, you know that the camps are going to be spawning soon. So you want to call out doing camps right after any of these objectives are over. Something that I usually do very quickly is I call out these camps, make sure that we can get some value out of it, and usually you want to invade. So you get a kill, objective ends, you invade, you get a camp, and now we can go for either flanking the enemy team, killing this Raynor who's just auto-attacking our base, or we could go and try to fight at another camp. In this case, we're going for the kills. Artanis is still down. We have a camp that's going to be distracting up top. This is a really, really good fight for us. We decide to just finish off this Raynor. Again, I don't know why I went Dragon Blade, but whatever. Maybe I got it for wave clear. Does it even deal damage to, uh, to minions? Yeah, it does. Okay. Hey, you know what? I got it for wave clear. That was my reasoning. Yep, and you can see they're distracted top. We've already killed one. It should be pretty easy for us to get this camp if we want to. Or we can go in and get another kill. I think it's better that that got interrupted because we may want it for if we lose an obje another objective. But what a lot of pros do is they, because this map is so snowball -y, they will actually just draft to win the lane and they won't draft any wave clear. And it's kind of a strategy you can do on this map where you don't draft any wave clear, but you do draft enough to where you can win in team fights. And if you win in team fights, then you win the objective and you don't need wave clear. But it's very risky. I usually like drafting at least one person with wave clear so that if you lose one objective, you don't automatically lose the game. In this case, we kind of lost some of our earlier objectives and we lost some of the earlier experience. And you can see we're starting to win team fights. We're starting to get camps really well and we're getting a lot of value. We got three kills, and if you get three kills, you want to go for the boss. One thing to know about this boss is he fires really fast. So if you have someone like a Genji who can deflect, he can deflect and do a lot of damage back, and then get it increased damage on the uh, boss. One thing to also know about the boss is he fires off in certain areas, so you want to make sure that you're splitting off your damage, and when he fires off in areas, you need to dodge it. Unless you're Genji, and then you want to deflect it. But Genjis can drop this boss very quickly just because the deflect will hit a lot because he attacks very, very quickly. As you can see, once you have the boss, this map becomes very easy to grab all the objectives because they're going to be distracted by the boss. I know Deckard's going to go for this objective, so we're going for camps just so we can keep distracting them as they're going to be distracted with the boss. Once they're done with the boss, we're going to have a camp pushing bottom. And they'll be able to get top back, but then they'll be distracted bottom lane. We could also get this camp as well if we want to, but instead we're going to simply fight. And that was actually a really good sleep. Because you can see it sets up the, uh, the kill right there. We could just dive in and finish her off. I don't know why I walked up there. If she was in the W build, I would have been dead. And you can see, because of that boss in the camp, we were able to get a full objective for free. And you can see they barely got any minions on their objective, but we have this giant one that's popping up. When you're on offense with Ragnaros, it's safe to use a lava wave immediately, just because it will kill all the minions so that nothing kills your minion wave. But sometimes it's also good to hold it off so that you can use one while they're trying to defend. In this case, we're just pushing hard as five, and we're going in for the kill. I'm going to speed up just a little bit. Again, you want to play a little aggressive when you're doing this. Um, you want to try to go for these kills. You want to split them up and try to get them from not DPSing. Um, of course, Genji dies again. I'm really showing that I'm an amazing Genji. I swear, I'm actually decent at Genji. I don't know, I don't know why I'm derping so hard this game. But uh, you can see 
against like a kill Thos, he can clear the wave really, really well. So if you do push, you need to make sure to distract the kill Thos as much as possible, as it can be very difficult. Now, when you're behind like this and you get a bunch of kills, your first thing that you should be doing is getting value off of it. They're going to get a fort. It might be good to get a fort or a camp, maybe both. We'll see what they end up choosing. Um, but you got to use all your abilities on this. Like you got to make sure to down it quickly. Kill Thos is only he was saving a lot of his abilities. You gotta just go for it. If you're trying to do stuff fast, you gotta do it really, really fast. I'm gonna fast forward. You can see they did get the camp. Now they're going to go for the keep, but this might be a little too aggressive just because we're all up. We will have lava wave available. We will have trait for Ragnaros available. We will have stay well and listen available, and we have all of Lunara's abilities available. So we can jump on them. We can split them up. We can get a lot of damage off. Um, and you can see just quite a bit. He burned his blind on Genji alone, which didn't end up working. Stay a while is going to sleep him, giving us time to kill either Raynor or Artanis or both. So they played too aggressive. What they probably should have done was gotten the camp, gotten the fort, and then gotten the front walls and then immediately left and let us deal with the, uh, the camp. But instead, we call out the camp now that a couple of them are dead, and we start getting all of the camps that we can before the objective spawns. So managing the camps on this map and drafting is the most important part. If you can manage the camps and draft well, you will pretty much always win this map. The play of this map is debatable compared to a lot of other maps, as there's not too many things to focus on. Meaning that you can't really choose to do too many different strategies on this map. At the end of the day, it's usually going to come down to how well you drafted and how well you manage the cams. And that is Brax's holdout. I will speed it up just because I've had people ask to see the core being destroyed. So we're going to speed it up just a wee bit. And we have a lava wave going out. We've got a boss going out. We've got the objective going out, which allows us to push in and finish off everything. And that is Brax's holdout. If you enjoy that, feel free to subscribe and check out some of the other map guides.